At the time that I was building, I really didn't care about the monthly dollar cash flow that I was getting. All I cared about was net worth growth and unit count growth because the more units you get, the more people take you seriously. Hey guys, my name is Julian Castle and today I'm with Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise is an expert in Section 8 housing. He buys rentals and today we're going to be talking about his journey. Tom, thank you for coming in. How are you doing today? Good, man. I appreciate you having me on the podcast. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Tom, I like to start my um, podcast interviews with a question. You suddenly lose everything. What would you do? I would essentially do what I did when I started, you know, originally uh, nine years ago. Um, I would accelerate it. When I did that by wholesaling properties. That's essentially how I got my start. If you don't know what that is, it's when you basically put a property under contract and then you try to find another buyer for it and you assign the contract to them for a much higher price and make the difference. It allows you to buy properties without having a ton of cash or it allows you to build cash flow without really having a bunch of cash starting out. And then from that, I reinvested that into rental properties. Um, I got to about 10 rental properties by reinvesting a lot of the money that I made from wholesaling assignment fees. And then from there, I um, started getting partners. You know, once I built an established track record of already having existing properties and starting, you know, renting them out, and then eventually got section eight tenants in them, um, that's how I was able to scale so quickly is by using other people's money to build portfolios. I would occupy them with section eight tenants. And then from that point forward, I would do cash out refinances because I forced so much value on those properties by um, having section eight tenants as my as as the people in those units. Um, and then I retained the units for myself after I performed the cash out refi. So that's essentially my, my main model was single family properties. Eventually I got into portfolios and then small multifamily duplexes, triplexes and quads. Got it. Cool. Um, just for context, you know, what is the unit count you have now? And how I'm many a little under, are you doing? Yeah, I'm a little over 650 units right now across four different states. Um, and I started uh, my mid 20s so about nine years ago. Cool. And um, how many deals are you doing a month currently? I'm buying anywhere from eight to 12 properties per month right now. Um, I don't buy a lot of portfolios right now. I'm mostly focusing on, um, I'm consolidating. I'm selling a lot of my properties that I originally bought in North Carolina that I've appreciated a lot. And then I'm buying five, six, seven properties in uh, lower price markets because there's where I started out has just exploded in, in value. So I'm just taking advantage of that. I'm doing a lot of 1031 exchanges and um, buying, you know, anywhere from eight to 10 units per month. Got it. And so let's um, dive into it. So wholesaling, sure. what is the first step to get yeah. into wholesaling? Yeah, the first pro part of the process is finding a market that has a lot of units that would work like that, that would work well with wholesaling, meaning they're distressed or meaning there's a lot of uh, houses that have been on the market for a long time. People aren't able to sell them. Uh, they're either, you know, too expensive. I also look for a lot of for sale by owners. Um, when you're not, when you don't have to deal with the real estate agent, it makes things a whole lot easier on getting the deal done. Um, and then from that point, it's a matter of putting the property under contract. So let's say if you buy, found a property for seventy thousand dollars, you put it under contract at seventy thousand um, dollars. Well, if it's listed at seventy thousand, you obviously want to get it at a lower price so you have margin there. So let's say you get it for fifty five thousand, and then you find someone that wants to buy it at. 65,000 or 63,000, you're making the difference between the 55,000 you have it under contract as, and then the 63,000 that you, you know, assigned it to. So you make $8,000 as an assignment fee on that deal. Um, the toughest part about wholesaling is really finding a buyer's list. Cause obviously you have to find, you know, flippers and other landlords or other people that would want to buy that deal. But once you have a good deal in a contract and you have it at a good, you know, um, price point, finding buyers for, for, for real estate is not that difficult, especially if you go to a lot of the real estate investor meetups, a lot of different um, interest-based events that I, that I went to that, that worked really well to, to build the buyer's list. That's great. So um, how can someone go in to the internet and find a market that makes sense? Yeah. I mean, I would recommend just, I, I, I use realtor.com. And then as far as the markets that I look for anywhere in the Midwest and the Southeast um, that, you're not going to find these properties that are going to be really good for it in New York City or San Francisco or these really expensive markets. Um, most of the time when I find these distressed properties, they're going to be in like Jacksonville, North Carolina, or even Jacksonville, Florida, uh, Fayetteville, North Carolina. These are markets that have generally lower median incomes. 
Uh, the population is maybe like a secondary or tertiary type of market, but it's not a major metropolitan area that I that I wholesaled in. Um, you also don't want to go too rural. You don't want to go too small because you won't find any buyers for it. And the inventory to buy will be pretty limited. But yeah, that's that's how I look for it. Got it. And, um, you know, once you find a market and, you know, what 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 do you do? How do you pull a list of uh, distressed home buyers? Yeah, I, I look on, on, like I said before, realtor.com. And I also use quite a bit of um, uh, Facebook Marketplace, Craigslist. It made, a lot of off-market sources work really well for identifying sellers that just haven't been able to sell their property. Um, we also did a lot of advertising. So we would do like Facebook ads where we would promote, you know, the we buy ugly houses or we buy houses type of uh, language. And then we would get inbound leads from that as well. We would also do bandit signs. So we'd put, you know, these signs out on the corner of the streets that say we buy houses, uh, cash, you know, tend to whatever the um, marketing that we were running at the time. And then we would just, we would try three or four different marketing techniques every single month um, between online with inbound marketing, more grassroots, you know, traditional bandit signs, and then also just, you know, scouring um, uh, online sales directories like Facebook or Craigslist or um, we also use, what was another one that we used? I think it was Hot Pass. There's a few like online directories for, for, for markets like that. Got it. Okay, so let's say, um, you know, one of the, my audience members goes and finds a, one of these uh, owners through one of these different marketing methods. How does someone find the right price to bid in you know, how do they find the comps? You know, how do they do that? Yeah, um, as far as comps, I just use, I'm not a licensed agent, so I don't have access to comps like that. I just use realtor.com. And if you look at just sold, you can see all the properties that sold in that area. Um, and that's a good way of get, kind of getting a baseline of what the values of the properties are going to be. And then from that point forward, um, it's just identifying which units are going to work the best for um, either your buyers. Ideally, you already have some buyers lined up that, you know, you already know what their buy box is. Because then from that point forward, it's just a matter of saying, hey, look, I already identified a property. I know that you like to do buy and hold on um, three bedroom units in this area, in this zip code. I already have a property identified for it. If if the numbers match up underneath the comps and if there's not if, if there's not a ton of repairs, ideally there's not a ton of repairs on the property that you're buying, um, then you can kind of just work out your, your profit margin there with your end buyer. Um, but yeah, that's essentially how we backed it into it. We knew that we had three buyers. They're buying you know, downtown at the beach and maybe like towards Jacksonville. And then we would identify properties in those areas, uh, make sure they're kind of within their buying criteria. We put them under contract and then it's just a matter of emailing, you know, the prospective buyer and go from there. Got it. Okay. So sounds like you kind of worked your way around and uh, went and got some buyers first. Um, could you touch on how you found these buyers? Yeah, that's what I was mentioning. I went to like real estate investor meetups. I would go to basically any type of in-person um, events that I could go to. It was a little tough um, during the pandemic in 2020 because I was still doing some wholesaling, you know, even three or four years ago. Um, it was mostly like digital events, but now it's all back to normal. So um, we would use meetup.com or just looking up real estate investor chapters. And then I would even meet uh, potential buyers of like cars and coffee and other types of interest-based events like that. Cool. All right. So, um, Great. So you find a distressed home buyer, you find some properties nearby that have been selling on realtor.com. Then you, you know, find a way, you know, what is the right uh, formula in order to make sure that you offer a right price so that you can then come and sell it after to your. I mean, I just low ball them uh, pretty much across the board, you know, from 25 to 30% under what they're asking for, especially if the property is under distress and if it needs some work, it just makes it that much better. You can go and try to figure out the ARV or the after repair value to determine what you're going to be buying it at. Um, generally, the properties that I was buying for these end, you know, buyers, um, I already knew how much they were paying in an order for them to, you know, be cash flowing, right? So if they're going to be flipping the property or if they're going to be a long-term landlord, I already kind of knew the model. Um, and that's just a matter of knowing your buyer and knowing exactly what type of properties they're looking for. And then you can look at the comps and say, hey, look, this three bedroom in this part of town just sold for 80 grand. Um, you know, if I can get it to you for that, it would probably make sense, especially if you're going to be flipping it and adding, enforcing value on it. So there's, there's a lot of different ways you can approach that. But I always just did it buyer specific versus just looking at a formula and saying, okay, I need to be at 20% on this property. And then I'm going to go find a buyer. We always looked for deals based on 
you know, otherwise it's just a waste of time because then you, you have no one to buy it and you're just stuck there, you know, waiting for the, the time to expire on the contract. Got it. Okay. And, um, great. So this is how you first started and then this is how you got some cash flow. Exactly. Yeah. And then, so I, um, yeah, that's essentially how I was able to have the down payment funds for uh, my first rentals. Gotcha. And so tell me how you want to come, how you went across, um, identifying your rentals. Yeah. I mean, I kind of, um, got into it by buying my first condo to actually live in. And then six months in, I decided that I was going to need a, I wanted a house, single family property, and I couldn't sell my condo because I was upside down on it. Actually, I'd only put mm -hmm. like three or 4% down with an FHA loan. So I ended up renting it, um, was making a couple hundred dollars over what my rental amount was or what my mortgage was. And that's kind of where I kind of got the idea of getting into the rental game. So then I started buying condos, 60 to $80,000 condos in Wilmington, North Carolina. Um, and then that was just kind of the start before I got Then Eventually I realized that HOAs are a joke and dealing with all the fees and assessments that came with HOAs was not something I wanted to deal with. So then I started buying single families in non HOA neighborhoods and then eventually got into section eight. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so you got into some good neighborhoods and you know, you got some property and then you decided the HOAs were not for you. So then you went right. across and investing some areas where there is no HOAs for a single family. Right. Um, how do you analyze a rental? Yeah, I mean, I knew that the rents in that area were around thirteen to fourteen hundred for a three bedroom. So if I was buying anything under a hundred grand um, for a lower income unit like that, I knew I was going to cash flow, especially with the debt that I was getting back then in 2017, 2018, 2019. It was still relatively like I think five and a half, six percent. So it wasn't any crazy investment uh, loan uh, interest rates at the time. And I was looking for units that were mostly turnkey. I've never bought a remodel. I never do any value add. I don't, I don't like to do any of that. I like to have a unit ready and closed, maybe one or $2,000 in cosmetic repairs uh, to pass, you know, inspections and get a tenant in there. But that's always been my model. I, I just hate dealing with contractors and subcontractors and all the unknowns that come with remodeling. So I just don't do it. Yeah. And uh, sounds good. Um, so tell me, about this uh, secret niche called Section 8? Yeah, so essentially after I got into single family, I eventually bought a, a property for $55,000 and it was rented at $1,350 per month. And mm. the day after closing, I come to find out that um, it was a Section 8 tenant, which the seller never disclosed to me when I was under contract with them, but didn't really matter. He was like, hey, we need to switch you over to your direct deposit um, so you can start receiving payments for that. And then from that point forward, um, I got my first, you know, section eight payment. I went through my first inspection, had to kind of go through trial and error. So it was freaking out. I mean, there's all these misconceptions about section eight and the tenants that come with it. And they're just misconceptions. They're just people for the most part, don't know what they're doing with section eight. And you get a lot of bad outcomes if you, you know, aren't sure how to manage it. Gotcha. So tell us about some of the differences and how you, what would you do when you learned about them? Yeah. So, I mean, really the only difference that you have with Section 8 as far as like a regular tenant is you have annual inspections, right? So the government will come and make sure that the property is being taken care of, that you're not being a slumlord, because if you aren't taking care of the property, or if the tenants are taking care of the property, then they're just going to stop the payment. You know, they'll give you a chance to fix it. But if you continue to fail inspections on a you know weekly basis um, or whenever they come out to reinspect, then they just stop making the payments until you remediate them. So that's the main difference between regular regular and and non and uh section eight the advantage is they pay way above market rent you know so when i was buying these properties back you know at that time in wilmington i was getting you know from 900 to 1100 and then section eight was paying you know significantly more um and now they even to this day if you go look in wilmington north carolina or new hanover county and look up what the section eight rents are there it's 1700 1800 for a three bedroom i think it's over 2000 now for a four bedroom just because the market's exploded there but um, those are the main difference. One is guaranteed income. Um, the other one is not. Gotcha. Okay. And um, how do you know how much over uh, the government's willing to pay with second aid housing? It's, public. it's all online. You can go look it up. They'll tell you exactly how much they pay for specific units in specific counties. Got it. And let's say you buy a property. Um, I don't believe that all properties are ready to be section eight. Is there a process for you to convert them to section eight? Or no, I mean, as long as they comply with the Section 8 guidelines, meaning they have to have like bedrooms and they have to have, you know, uh, a living room and there's other, you know, uh, 
parameters that has to has to fit. But I mean, I can make this penthouse condo in Miami right now, section it if I wanted to. There's really nothing preventing me from doing it. Um, it's a protected, you know, class. So I can't, as long as the whole building allows section eight or allows rentals, long-term rentals, then I could section eight it here if I wanted to. So it's not the tenant. It's not the house that's section eight, it's the tenant. So just think of it as like, you can have, if you buy a vacant property, the property itself is not section eight approved. It's the tenant that's approved. And when they move in, it becomes a section eight unit because they're rented to section eight. And when the tenant leaves, it could the be- The tenant leaves, eight. it's just, it can be, you can do anything you want with it. Yeah. Got it. Okay. So it's not like section eight or not section eight. It's it's just based on the tenant and their occupancy. Got it. That, that's, uh, that's something that that's good to know. Um, and tell me, um, for example, you just mentioned this example about your apartment here in Miami. Does the government do section eight for luxury condos, for example? Yeah. No, 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 no. So they will pay for it, but it doesn't make any sense. So this apartment here is three and a half million dollars. The payment on it on a mortgage would be 20,000 a month. But section eight in Miami pays three thousand a month for a three bedroom, right? So you can never cash flow on a on a luxury apartment like this. Got it. Okay, so there yeah. is a predetermined amount that the government is willing to pay based, based on bedroom on count and based on um, location. Got exactly. you. So I go online, I look. You know, Miami is three thousand dollars. That means that if I get a property that's renting at two thousand dollars, for example, then you can cash flow. I'm cash flowing a thousand. Exactly. Makes sense. And so tell me, um, how were you able to scale? And what I'm really getting to is like, how do you operate all of these units at the same time? Because I'm sure you have a pro project manager, you can't do it all yourself, right? And so yeah. I, have, I have nine full-time property managers across four states that handle all my properties. Uh, my involvement is maybe three to five hours per week. And that generally consists of like a Zoom calls with them on Fridays and then just manual approval of any large ticket items that, you know, might need to get handled. Like we had a house burned down the other day, we had to deal with the insurance claim and then we we sold it because we never, like I said, we, we never renovate, we never rebuild. We just uh, get the replacement cost coverage um, and then we sell the burnt down unit to like a flipper or somebody that wants to, you know, do new construction there. But um, as far as how I scaled, it's kind of like what I mentioned earlier. I would buy a lot of, I started out by reinvesting the cash that I had from wholesaling. I built a track record. That's all that matters. Um, you can't go to any other investor and uh, approach them asking them for money without having proof that you know what you're doing. So I knew I had to do that as fast as possible. And that's kind of when I started buying the condos and then eventually the single families and then eventually getting into Section 8. And when I had you know two or three Section 8 units and I was able to prove that out for a few months, it was a lot easier to go to an investor and say, hey, look, I already have these, you know, nine or 10 units. Some of them are on section eight, like I'm getting guaranteed income. Um, do you want to, I want, I have these other hundred units that I want to buy right now for 7 million. I don't have the 20% down for the bank for 1.4 million. You know, do you want to put that in? We'll split the equity. We'll split the the expenses. We'll split the cash flow. And then in three years, I'll, I'll occupy all these properties or two years. I think it was 24 months is normally what I would ran. And then in 24 months, I'll occupy all these properties with section eight. We'll go to the bank, do a cash out refinance. You'll get your, you know, monthly cash flow, and you'll also get your return. Um, and that's just generally how I ran it. That's amazing. And so, in terms of the equity split that you're giving to the investor, is it fifty fifty or it varies? You know, it's fifty fifty on the equity split, and then for cash flow, generally give them a little bit more, um, uh, depending. It just depends on who the investor was. Like, if I it was an acquaintance, then obviously we could work out a, a better deal. If it's a complete stranger that I met through a cars and coffee event. And then, you know, um, at, the, at the time that I was building, I really didn't care about the monthly dollar cash flow that I was getting. All I cared about was net worth growth and unit count growth, because the more units you get, the more people take you seriously, right? You can go to a bank and the second they ask you to see your balance sheet and rent roll and you show them that you have 500 units, even if you have partners on them, like it's a whole different game. The term sheet changes, the relationship changes, it, the opportunities change. So all I cared about was whatever terms they wanted, if it was remotely reasonable, I would accept it because I knew I was going to be buying them out anyways. And I knew that I was going to be retaining the units anyways. Um, so that was always, always part of my strategy was just net worth accumulation. Got it. And um, so that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, can you explain a little bit about what cash out refinance is and what the strategy is in terms on, you know, a bigger scale? Yeah. So like, let's say uh, we go and buy for even numbers, a million dollars worth of properties, hundred thousand dollars each property. So call it ten properties that we buy, and uh, all ten of them are vacant, right? Mm -hmm. And 
normally what we would do is we would occupy all 10 properties with Section 8 tenants. So let's say that all 10 properties are generating $0 per month. And now we've put 10 tenants in there at $1,500 a month each. It's now generating $15,000 a month in gross rents or I don't know, like $140,000, $150,000 per year. So from that point forward, um, when we would do a cash out refinance, we would have them come do an appraisal. And now we can show them a rent roll of you know uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars per year that are guaranteed that we can show verified bank statements showing, hey, look, this is a guaranteed portfolio with Section 8 tenants that has been stabilized. Now that prop portfolio bit was, you know, comes from being worth next to nothing to a lot more. And generally we would see 20, 25% bump in valuation simply by occupying. And we wouldn't touch it. We wouldn't remodel. We wouldn't do anything. So all we were doing was forcing appreciation through rent rolls. And then we would go do a cash out refinance, go to the bank, ask for a bigger loan. Um, I would only ever pull out the amount of equity that I needed to buy out my partner. I would never max out the cash out, even though I could have, um, cause I still wanted to retain equity in the deal. I still wanted to be able to cash flow monthly. Got it. So for example, you say you bought this properties for $3 million. So when you guys go in together, the investor owns half of that. So he owes 1.5. Correct. On and a $3 million then, purchase. Yeah. And then after you guys have, after you have retenant the houses, then the NOI changes and the valuation changes and it's higher. Exactly. Yeah. And then you basically pull out money to pay out that one and a half million dollars. Exactly. Yeah. And that's also the cash flow that is being built month to month. So let's say it takes two years to do that cash out refi or two, two and a half, however long it takes to stabilize everything. Mm -hmm. On 10 units, it would take a year. But let's just say that it was two years. Um, I also pull whatever cash flow they were getting monthly. That's deducted from their initial, you know, cash out lay on the down payment. So then that would just be removed from that. So Got then it. Whatever, okay. whatever the balance was would be paid out to them as a cash out refund. Got it. So they're getting paid based on their equity and the cash right. flow goes towards that. Plus the sell also goes towards the. Towards the as well. And they'd be paid according to whatever the equity structure was. Exactly. Okay. Got it. And so I'm, I'm sure they capture some of the upside, right? Oh yeah. Yeah, of course. So that was, that's a big part of it is they wanted to, you know, see appreciation in as well, but most of them just wanted a place to park their money. For, for most of them and also get the, the benefits of the deduction because we could split up, you know, a lot of them made a lot more money than me, obviously. So that's why they were in this liquidity position. So they needed these write-offs. So they could take 70% and I could take 30% and they're super happy about any losses and depreciation that we had. So um, that was part of the deal as well, that they would be able to benefit on a higher end from, from the losses. Right. And so tell the audience why an investor with a high net worth would benefit from depreciation, for example? Um, because they would have, let's say they have a ton of a ton of income and they might have not bought, they may have not had enough expenses or deductions for that year. And now they're able to write off a lot of the deductions and losses from that portfolio. Um, even if they're just paper losses, it just reduces their taxable income. So they pay less, they pay less in federal and state income tax. Got it. And so um, could, uh, could I hear a pitch, for example, for the investor? Like you put in the money and then What's the upside above, you know, the the price? Is it like a twenty eighty or you know, or seventy thirty? I, I would leave that completely up to them. It's their money. Um, I wouldn't actually pitch them on a return. I would say, hey, look, what do you need in order for me to get this one point two million and one point three million? And generally, it was twenty thirty percent return that they're looking for on the overall you know time horizon of the of the investment. So I don't know, ten to twelve percent per year. Most most of them are really happy in because outperforming at the time the stocks that they had their money you know sitting in. And it was a real asset and they got the cash flow monthly and they got the tax benefits and, you know, the risk was really low. So that was all really attractive to them. As far as the actual pitch that I would pitch them, it was, hey, look, man, um, I have all these properties that are currently rented out, stabilized and guaranteed. Um, I know that you have nothing else in your portfolio that has guaranteed passive cash flow every single month. I already have my management team in place. You don't have to do anything. You literally have to meet me at the attorney's office, write a check, close on it, and then I'll send you your, your cash flow split every single month. And then I'll see you in two years when I decided to do a cash out refi. So I, I almost forced them to be a silent partner. I, I want no involvement from them on a day-to-day -day basis. I don't want them to have any involvement on the, the operation, on, you know, hey, like, who's this employee? Who are we hiring here? All this other stuff. So that's a big part of it. Yeah, that makes sense. I just make it as passive and as easy for them as possible. And then they see that, you know, we, we set up our own LLC, it's joint LLC, like we're, we're each, 
you know, members of it. So it's all legit. We have an attorney, we have operating agreements. We, I mean, I very clearly define the roles that they have in the, in the deal. Got it. And so I want to get a little bit of knowledge on, you said you were buying a hundred units. Um, so when you buy a hundred units, is it valued at a multifamily kind of scenario? So that there is a cap rate on it. Um, but for the most part, we were looking at, we were looking at it more on a comp basis and seeing what properties are selling in the area. And they, the appraiser at the time for the hundred units that we did buy, it was actually 92 units that we bought at one time for, we bought it for 6.2 million. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think it was like sixty some thousand dollars per door. Um, their valuation was blended between what recent properties in the area had sold combined with what the rent was. The main reason we bought that portfolio was because the landlord previously had no idea what he was doing and there was no streamlined process. Like he still had a physical office where tenants had to go and deposit their like money order into a box outside the door. Like that's how primitive we're talking. So we went in there and streamlined everything and we were able to uh, increase the rents dramatically with section eight. Got it. Okay. Um, so how many deals did you do when it comes to uh, big units? You know, I mean, I've probably bought three portfolios um, since I started. Majority of my acquisitions has been like creating these mini portfolios is what I call them. So in a given month, I might make 30 or 40 offers and then be able to maybe get eight or 10 under contract. And then what I'll do is I'll send all 10 of those to the bank and do one blanket loan, or I'll just buy them all cash all at one time and do one one big closing. That way it allows me to handpick each individual property. A big mistake that people make is they'll try to buy a portfolio because they want to scale fast. But every portfolio that you'll ever buy with single family units in it is going to be filled with trash. There's at least 20 to 30% of them. The landlord just wants to, the, the current owner throws them into a portfolio because they know that they're good units will jack up the valuation of their shittier units, right? Yeah. So I really don't like buying portfolios unless there's a ton of due diligence unless like we're manually inspecting every unit, a lot, a lot of them will also stuff them with bad tenants. You know, if, if you have 70% occupancy and you are about to sell your portfolio, guess what? You're going to go find as many people as you can to fit, fill the other 30%, say that we have hundred percent occupancy and you put a bunch of criminals and just like rejects that you don't want in your, in your properties at all. And then you're stuck evicting them over the next, you know, however long. Yeah. So how did you go about doing that? Because I know, when it comes to multifamily, you know, it's easy to get a, a general contractor, for example, to go in with his team and check out all the units. But when it comes to different houses, like a portfolio of houses, are these houses mostly made up into one area or are they? Oh, yeah. Out? yeah, it's all one zip code. It's all in one zip code. Yeah. OK, so it, it kind of is kind of like a general contractor or person comes in and still does all the inspections and all that. Yeah, at the time when I didn't have a ton of units and I was buying my first portfolio, I actually had a um, a, hand, a full time handyman that I hired to be able to go look at those properties and also come up with estimates to fix whatever needed to be fixed. Like I said, we weren't buying really terrible shit units, so it was mostly like, "Hey, these outlets don't work. Section eight's going to fail. That hey, these windows aren't locking. We need to put new locks." So those are the types of things that we looked for. Got it. Because as you mentioned earlier, you're mostly focused on turnkey properties. Right. Exactly. Got it. Okay. And uh, tell me what got you into real estate? I mean, it was a, a complete accident. Um, I, I was not planning on doing it. I had a marketing company in college. I also did uh, software. I had like an e-commerce uh, marketing software at the time that I was working on. And when I got, got into buying my first condo out of college, I decided that, hey, this is simply just kind of like a stepping stone until I can get that single family property that I really want. I ended up buying a, a big dog, like a government pincher. My condo didn't allow me to have that dog in the in the condo. Mm -hmm. So I had to go and buy a house with a fence. And that was kind yeah. of the catalyst to be able to rent out that condo. That kind of gave me the light bulb moment to, hey, I'm making $400 a month over my mortgage. And I did zero work this entire month. And they weren't even Section 8. This was a regular tenant. Um, uh, let me see if I can keep doing more of this. Because like I said, I had a marketing company. So we would have done... $500 a month as a marketing retainer for a company. I have to talk to them every single week. You know, it was a huge headache and I hated doing it. So when I saw that I could make the same money without doing anything by just simply owning a property, that's kind of when I started getting more and more into real estate. Got it. And so uh, tell me a little bit about how your mind works in terms of like, you decided obviously to go big um, and scale, you know, obviously for you, high net worth and units are what's important to you. Right. How were you able to 
streamline this process? Um, it was just a lot of trial and error. I mean, at the time there was no course or coaching or consulting on section eight. Most of the people that were doing it were either doing like large scale projects and like government housing. So I really didn't have any mentors to lean on. It was just a matter of like, okay, this condo worked great. Okay. This condo, uh, sucks cause it was part of an HOA. Let me go about try single family. So I bought a lot of properties for like 150, 160 grand, uh, that were single family in non HOA neighborhoods. And then was like, all right, that's great. But I just blew $30,000 on a down payment. Now I got to wait another three months to recuperate, you know, money and rents and reinvest. So I then from that point, I was like, what happens if I buy a $55,000 house? And that's when I bought the, you know, the section eight property that I didn't know was section eight at the time. Mm -hmm. So then I accidentally bought that house. And then I realized that section eight was a really good method. So then I was like, okay, well, I now know about section eight. I don't know about inspections. Let me find out how I screen tenants because I lost a ton of money at the beginning by putting in shitty tenants, by getting bad, you know, hard money loans, by not choosing properties that were, you know, ideal for section eight. I bought a lot of two bedrooms. Section mm -hmm. eight pays 20, 30% more on three and four bedrooms. Like there's no reason to be buying a two bedroom at the time. So mm -hmm. all these things that you kind of learn, and that's kind of what eventually I compiled into a course, into a coaching program to help, you know, new section eight investors avoid all these pitfalls. Got it. And uh, tell us, how do you find Section 8 uh, tenants? I mean, when you're buying 100 yeah. doors, for example, I mean, that they find you. So for the most part, let's say you buy a property and then you get it ready for Section 8 inspection. You call up the local housing authority, say, hey, look, I have a unit on 123 Main Street. It's a three bedroom. It's ready to go. They have a list of people looking for properties, right? So depending on how sophisticated that county is, like certain places that I invest in, um, they'll have like an email list and they'll just email up all the, all the prospective tenants. And then they reach out to you directly and they go look at the property. Some of them have like a literal bulletin board in their you know office that they'll put the address on there and tenants can go there and look at it. But we also advertise like on, you know, Craigslist and Facebook marketplace and stuff like that. Got it. And okay. So they have a list. So basically when you, if someone is to go get a property and decide to rent it out to a section eight tenant, how do you know with confidence, whether you're going to have a tenant? Is there a way to check how many people are on the waiting list or yeah. I mean, you can just call the housing authority in your county and tell them, Hey, look, I'm at the poverty line and I want a section eight voucher. And they're probably going to first laugh at you and then tell you it's going to be anywhere from two to five years before you can get on, you know, get a, a free housing voucher. That's how big the demand is for affordable housing in the U S. So there's a never ending demand for it is what so, I'm trying to tell you. So there's, there's always, uh, there's always tenants. Two years to five years out waiting yeah. list for you to even get, you know, get a, a voucher to be able to then go look for a property. So anytime we post a new property for sale, we'll probably get, I would say anywhere from 30 to 50 applicants in the first week. It's, it's, I mean, in, in almost any market that we do. Got it. And so can you tell me some of your best practices when it comes to uh, tenanting someone? As far as like screening? Yeah. Oh, section eight tenant. I, I, yeah. I, yeah. So a big part of that, it just comes down to eviction history. We want to make sure they're, they've ever been evicted, make sure they're not a convicted felon, make sure they're not a sex offender, all the obvious low hanging stuff. Um, mm -hmm. Also check their credit, um, make sure that they're going to be at least somewhat responsible on paying their portion because even though section eight does pay the majority of the rent, some of the tenants have like a hundred or a $75 portion that they still need to pay. And we want to make sure they're going to pay that. Um, and we also check their current property. I have my property manager go drive to their property, knock on their door and say, Hey, look, we want to just do an inspection to make sure that, um, you know, we know exactly what we're getting into. So that that's a big, uh, indicator of how they're going to treat your property as well. Got it. Sounds good. Um, and so when it comes to multifamily, um, are you looking into getting into multifamily in section eight and no, not at all. What is the reason why you're sticking to family, single families? Um, because I don't want to deal with creating a housing project, you know, creating a large scale Section 8 government housing project with all the tenants on top of each other. It's not something I really want to do uh, for a few reasons. One, liquidity. Right now, if I go buy 100 units and I want to peel off 20 of them, sell them and do a 1031 into a larger portfolio, I can easily. If I want to go sell a 100 unit apartment complex, it's very difficult. Um, it's also a lot harder to sell. It's a lot less buyers that are interested in buying a hundred unit low income section eight, you know, um, apartment unit versus being able to peel off units. So it's liquidity is a big reason. Also expenses. I don't want to have to deal with on-site property managers. I don't want to deal with the amenities that come with dealing with an apartment complex or the HOAs or the parking or everything else that comes with that. 
Um, when you have a tenant in a single family property, they're taking care of their property, they're cutting their own grass, they're uh, holding their own, you know, um, homeowners insurance policies for, for content. It's just as a whole, just a whole lot easier. And um, we find appreciation is much higher as well. Single family properties, the demand, Section 8 pays more, by the way, than they do on a, an apartment. So single family demands higher rent and people just want a place that they can call their own with their own backyard. And, you know, it's, we never have a shortage of demand with, with a single family property. So that's a big part of it. That makes sense. Got it. So um, tell me what's your number one productivity hack? Um, that's a good question. I would say I always make a list before I go to sleep of what I want to accomplish the next day. That's just like the top three things. And it's always income producing things. That's the thing. A lot of people get kind of stuck in this and it kind of screws them over is they make these huge to-do lists and then they get, you know, uh, none of them actually move the needle for the bottom line and mm -hmm. everything that I do is going to have some impact on, on, on the revenue and making sure that it's improving over the previous, previous month. And for me, that comes down to acquisitions, right? So if we're not adding properties to the portfolio, if we're not looking at um, other ways to improve the education business, because like I said, uh, I also uh, teach and do consulting on, on section eight and low income housing, then it, it really, there's really no point. So I never really have more than I would say three to four things on that list. And I, I typically work in sprints, you know, three to four hours at a time, making sure that, you know, I identify, let's say 10 properties today. I wanted to identify 10 properties that we could put under contract for this month. Another thing that I wanted to do was um, we're creating an updated content that we could offer as an upsell for current section eight students. So stuff like that, you know, that would actually um, produce more income is, is what I focus on. And that's really, I would say my number one productivity hack. Got it. And so let's talk about some of your teachers yeah. um, who have, has helped who has helped you in your life get to where you are definitely my parents um they're the number one as far as supporting and encouraging me to kind of take the entrepreneurship route they never kind of downplayed it or, or talked down on it because i know a lot of people want hey go to college get a good job blah 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 i did go to college i never had any intention of getting a good job um i always knew i wanted to do entrepreneurship on some level or investing on some level so um they helped a lot neither of them are in real estate so it was mostly just like moral support and you know kind of providing um guidance on on certain things that i want to do i mean they they've bought multiple houses for you know primary residents but never rental or investments so they were able to kind of guide me there and then eventually um when i kind of got started there some of my partners that i worked with um they eventually started helping me with just more general business advice um as we started kind of moving through it especially if they had already been in, involved in investment properties so those are kind of the the two big ones with ex partners combined with my parents Got it. Um, how did you pick your partners? Is it how? Yeah. Just how much money they had. So you want basically to solely liquidity. Because that's all I was using them for was this liquidity, making sure that um they were gonna be able to provide in order to get the deal closed. Anything after that, culture wise or fit, I figured that out, you know, and I, I can get along with anybody. So as long as we agreed on terms, the rest of it was pretty straightforward. Got it. And so did you meet these people at Cars and Coffee? And the meetups, for example, is that is that where you found these people or did you do it? Yeah. So like I said, real estate investor association meetups are really good. There's a lot of investors that are there. And if you have a good deal, it's pretty easy to partner up with people there. And they're already in that mindset. Um, I did meet one partner um, at the Cars and Coffee event and mm -hmm. we did a bunch of deals together. And then where else I met another one? It was from LinkedIn. It was like a mutual acquaintance. That's another thing that I did a lot of when I was building my portfolio was talking about it. People love to you know, move in silence and, you know, uh, what is it? Money whispers, wealth, you know, speak, whatever the <laughs> attitudes about that. I didn't give a fuck about it all. If I was buying 20 unit deal, I was putting it on Instagram. I was talking to people about it. I was kind of explaining how it worked because people love seeing numbers. They love seeing income. So I had no problem bragging about it. Hey, look, I just bought 20 units in Wilmington, North Carolina. It's going to generate $6,000 a month in net income. And this is how I did it. And, um, I would have a different story basically every week. And the side effect, I had no idea what I was doing outside of just simply, you know, flexing on people, which is always fun. But at the time, <laughs> it started building like, oh, you're the Section 8 guy. So whenever someone had a deal, they would just send it to me. And then that was kind of the byproduct of that. And I really, you know, that eventually helped really accelerate things and get more partners involved. And like I said, I eventually met somebody from LinkedIn um, who was referred to me. And, you know, he had half a million bucks he wanted to invest. So we, we did a partnership together and bought a bunch of units. So that was that's basically um, 
how I was able to network. Got it. Um, tell me, um, what, what is, when you, do you have any negotiation tactics when you go into a seller meeting, you know, when you were starting out and as you develop now into a hundred million, I'm sorry, to a hundred doors, like, uh, portfolio purchases, um, um, that you can give. As far as negotiation tactics, I would always just look at how motivated they were going to be, right? And that's generally a result of how long the property has been on the market. Um, I would always put the property under contract by almost any means necessary by telling them almost whatever they wanted to hear in order to get it under contract. And then once it's under contract, you have all the power, right? Because they can't pull out from the deal because they're already signed and you're able to do your due diligence. You can do your inspections. And the last thing they want in their head, they already know that the property is sold, right? They're expecting it to sell. And you have a lot more leverage to be able to demand, you know, repairs or demand um, reductions in price or closing credits because they probably have already moved on onto what they want their next project or what they want to do. So my biggest thing was always to be able to make sure that my agent would get the property in a contract, even if it was full list price. And mm -hmm. then from there, we would be able to beat them down um, another 10, 15% um because they don't want to show it as as falling out of escrow no agent wants to explain to the next potential buyer like hey uh this fell out of contract because x y and z because it just makes it look bad and no one really wants to deal with it so that was probably the biggest thing was uh was that and then i would also always look at the repair list that they had um there's always a repair list no matter how nice the house is and i would leverage that to get you know a better deal as well got it and um tell me now that you've developed and you've grown a bigger operation what are some key things that you do in order to find the best talent to put in place for these positions at your company? Um, really, my only positions are property managers and I only hire entry level property managers. So I really don't care about their skill level or experience. Um, I like to be able to teach them our style and our policies and kind of our, our model. And it just works a lot better. Um, I hate people that come in with preconceived notions. They don't want to deal with section eight or they don't know about section eight, or they might've done one section eight deal and they don't want to manage it. So basically almost all of my employees are between 25 and 30 years old, all entry level that I've been able to kind of grow up, grow into as far as their roles. And then, um, I overpay all of them. So for the most part, they have very little incentive to leave. And then I also give them like upward mobility options as far as, um, being in acquisitions, if they want to help me, you know, buy properties, or if they want to help be transaction coordinators on it as well, um, I kind of work with them as well on that. So um, I don't look for the best talent. I just look for the most, I guess, trainable or most best communication, best best organized is, is super helpful in, in this space as well. Got it. Um, so let's take a few minutes and talk about your course and coaching program. Um, yeah. Yeah. When, when, when you start um, this coaching program? So I started about a year and a half ago. Um, I was on TikTok. Or I still am on TikTok and Instagram. And anytime I posted a deal or posted a closing, people would always ask a million questions about how I did it. You know, how did I get partners? How did I buy properties from out of stakes? I started doing that as well. And um, eventually I just got to the point where I was like, you know, I might as well just make a whole video course on this and explain it all at once. And then maybe I'll make some additional passive income through the sale of the course. And that morphed into then coaching. Then I started doing one-on-ones. So then I was getting paid to talk about real estate all day, which I really enjoy. So uh, <laughs> that was nice. And then I started doing webinars and kind of teaching people at scale. And then I built out my own software to kind of help people find the deals. Um, we have a bunch of different data sources that show all the seller finance deals in the country that shows, you know, the properties based on the cash flow. So you can filter based on cash flow. So um, we started selling that. Now it's kind of become like a whole education company and suite of products that we offer to new investors. That's great. Um, can you highlight top one, two uh, students that you have and their story? Yeah. So we have one student, his name is Jackson. Uh, he started with me about a year ago. He um, didn't have much cash to start. So we helped him with the creative financing. And he started buying lists of properties for absentee landlords and then um, reaching out to them, like mm -hmm. sending letters every day, like physical le letters in the mail to the address mm -hmm. and trying to reach them. And eventually he found somebody that would, that offered a 90% loan to value deal on a seller finance deal. He needed mm -hmm. to come up with 10%. Uh, he financed that through a hard money lender uh, that was willing to be in the second position on it and bought a bunch of properties with uh, basically 0% down. I think it was 142 properties that he was able to buy from this portfolio in order to do that. 
And that was all many events, section eight, you know, majority of them. I think he's been doing that for the last, I don't know, six months, just stabilizing that portfolio. And um, he'll eventually do a cash out refinance and he'll have a ton of equity in it because he's been able to jack up the overall rent roll on that portfolio significantly. That's great. So um, this student of yours started about a year ago and yeah. is now 168 units and is doing the section eight method. So it's 142 and, units right now, as far as I know, he might have a little bit more. Um, I haven't checked recently on where he's at, but yeah. And then he, he uh, occupied them with section eight. Got it. And so can you, for someone that's listening, um, what is that in cash flow in terms? Um, or like, to, yeah, yeah. so for, for him, a lot of the equity. properties, I mean, the equity, he, he was the only partner. He was the only investor buying it, buying into it. So it, he, he retained hundred percent of the, of the equity on that deal. Um, as far as the cash flow, obviously it's limited because he, you know, basically mortgaged the entire thing at 100% loan to value. Mm -hmm. uh, so he had payments to not only um, the seller, but also to the hard money lender, which I think at the time was like seven and a half percent was the rate on on the 10% that he borrowed. Mm -hmm. uh, but the main attractive part of that is a lot of the units were vacant. So he was able to reoccupy them with much higher value tenants quicker and uh, I think he was like cash flowing like twenty twenty five thousand dollars $25,000 the last time I checked. Um, on a monthly level there. Got it. So this was in one year. And again, he yeah. bought a portfolio, right? He bought a portfolio, which I advise him actually not to because it's, it's a lot to take on, especially as a new investor. And he bought it out of state. He wasn't even local. So he had to hire two property managers to take over um, the day-to-day the -day management of it. But um, he, he wanted to go big or go home. So I just kind of supported him after he, he made the offer and got it somehow under contract. <laughs> That's great. Um... And uh, do you have any other case study you'd like to highlight? Um, majority of the other students are, are new students that are coming, that are either in college, or university, or they have a full-time job and they want to, they have money. Uh, they have, you know, 10, 15, $20,000 minimum, and they want to invest it somewhere. That's like the biggest, I think, uh, hurdle that people have is they have all this saved money, but they have no idea what to do with it. They don't want to put it into crypto. They don't want to put it into stocks. They don't want to put it into Amazon. So Section 8 offers a really good alternative that allows them to, you know, cash flow monthly. Got it. Yeah, that, that's interesting. And so for anyone that wants to um, hear more from you, learn more from you, okay. check them out on Instagram, where can they do that? Yeah, so uh, as far as if you want to learn more, I'll do a webinar at Section 8 the number eight webinar.com section eight webinar.com mm -hmm. or you can just get me directly if you have any questions uh my instagram handle is t cruise nc that's t as in tom cruise c-r-u-z n-c like north carolina um or you can just email me tom at tom cruise.com got it um sounds good so uh thank you tom i really appreciate having you on today and yeah uh, no problem it, it's exciting to hear about the section eight world and yeah. um Happy to have my listeners learn about this because it's something that I never presented. So um, thank you. And uh, yeah, you know, no hope to, for you to come on in the future. Thanks. I appreciate it. Awesome. Have a great day. Yeah, you too.